So uh, yeah, so my name is Edda Nicholson. Um, I'm currently a lecturer at the University of Wolverhampton um, and I finished my PhD on the GFTU's early history last year, although it does kind of feel like five minutes ago, but yes, it was last year. Um, I say I'm currently a, a lecturer at the university. I'm actually leaving in a couple of weeks. I'm going to take up a post with PCS as an organizer. So I'm kind of moving from academia right into the movement. Um, which is kind of following my research interest into sort of the real world. But uh, for now, still still a historian and I do, as, as uh, Marie has intimated, I, I do like to do a lot of uh, public work if I possibly can. I, I do a, a few interviews and things like that. I've done a little bit on radio. And uh, last night I was on Channel 5 talking to Jay Blades about the Chainmaker strike in 1910. Um, so I love to use any opportunity that I possibly can to talk about strike history and trade union history. So that was that was a lot of fun, very cold film, but it was a lot of fun. So um, the GFTU, they are, I would stress that they are a very, very different organization now than they were in their early history. So they were founded in 1899 and they, they have moved on, I think over the decades to be something quite different now. They, they have a lot of emphasis on their education program. I'm very proud to be a, a trustee of the Educational Trust. Um, but actually they were founded uh, to be a strike fund administrator. So they collected a national strike fund and they also used their, um, their experience to help unions kind of navigate strikes and disputes as well. So they had a lot of very sort of different role back in, in 1899 in the, in the early years. Um, so I will focus on um, the period from 1899 to 1926 when we had the general strike. I'll talk a little bit about why they were created and sort of the background uh, in the 1890s um, and a little bit about what they did in the First World War, because I think that's when they were most influential on the national stage. And then I'm going to finish by talking about why they changed their remit and why they, they became uh, quite a background organisation for the, a few decades in the 20th century before sort of re-emerging after the Second World War. Okay. Try and make sure that actually moves along. There we go. So, like I said, they, they were created in 1899 by the TUC. They were voted into, ex into existence, um, although it did take a, a little while for them to actually come to fruition. Um, so it, it's, it's, not really, it's not really a clear picture of trade unionism in, in Britain at this time. Um, in the 1870s, there was an economic downturn and a lot of unions were absolutely decimated. Um, one of the first things to go when you are having to tighten your purse strings was your extra trade union subs. So a lot of trade unions completely disappeared in the 1870s. But then in the 1880s and 1890s, there was a bit of a resurgence, but this is really patchy in terms of geography um, and in terms of trade as well. So where there, was trade what, there were trade unions flourishing, there were also trade unions that were not doing so well. But in the, in the 1890s, we saw a lot of high profile strikes. There on the left, you've got Annie Besant with some of the matchstick um, girls. They had a very famous, very high profile strike in 1888. And it was about pay. They were, they were paid very badly, but it was also about their working conditions because they had abysmal working conditions. They had horrible um, industrial diseases that they used to suffer from because of the, the chemicals they were working with. And what was really quite unique about this was that the public sympathy was really aroused by their stories and, and middle class kind of viewers actually started to change their minds. And the same going for the, the image there on your right, the Dockers. They also had a very high profile strike and they, were, um, they had these huge, huge demonstrations that were going through streets. And, and it was really notable that they were very peaceful. And I think that there were a lot of middle class commentators would sort of be quite surprised by this. So there wasn't the kind of, rowdy rabble that they were expecting it was actually really eloquent and they were really able to to explain why they were going on strike so these were really quite sort of um quite movable changeable times now at, at the time that the dockers were on strike they were actually um it was quite difficult for them to strike because they had nothing <laughs> they were they were really really badly paid and it was very kind of casualized work so um, it was very difficult, very, very terrifying for them to go on strike, in fact, because they don't have, they didn't have any kind of safety net. And how we used to sort of fund a lot of the strikes, and we, we do still do it now, we've just been talking about strike fund, haven't we, about donations and things. It really was all about what you could get from the rest of the movement and who could donate what money, it could be philanthropists, it could be other trade unions, and that's how you funded a strike. But it was more, 
the, the reason for the GFG to come into existence was they wanted a centralized strike fund. There would be something that was like a national fighting fund that they could, they could rely on. And, uh, but the problem was, no one could agree on how that should be made and who should look after it, how much people should pay into it and when you should deserve any money of it. So the debates in the TUC about this kind of federation that could exist, they kind of carried on for a few years. Um, but it wasn't really until much later in, in 1897, there was a, a big um, lockout for the Amalgamated Society of Engineers. Now they, the ASC were a really powerful union because they were very wealthy. They were a skilled union, so um, a lot of their members earned a, a pretty decent wage, and then of course they could pay in a bit more for their membership subs. And they were a very well respected uh, trade union, and they had a lot of um, uh, branches that were across the country as well. So when they went out to try and obtain an eight-hour day, a lot of people expected that they would be quite successful, um, but they weren't, unfortunately. Um, the the main reason really is because even though we had these kind of high profile strikes of you know, the, the matchstick workers and, and the dockers, um, if you want to really look at sort of class unity and class solidarity, the employer class has always been very good at that. And they were taking a lot of uh, a, a leaf out of the trade union book and they were forming their own federations. So they had employer federations in different trades and some were not so militant, the, the engineers were very, the engineering employers federation were extremely strong and, and very, very hostile to the trade union world in general. So when the ASC went, when they had one branch that went out in London, the, the ASC, sorry, the, the engineering employers federation, they started locking out, had a rolling lockout of, of so many different factories across the country to put pressure on the ASC to stop their demand for the hour day. And they were successful, unfortunately. So it was really the failure of the ASC lockout strike. There was a, a strike and a lockout at the same time. They really spurred on this discussion that, that we had to have some sort of national strike fund that the, the whole movement could rely on. And so in the 1899 TUC, um, they, they voted in the GFTU to do that. Okay, so brings me neatly on to the GFTU itself. Um, I've just put just a, a snapshot there. These are just some of the unions that were affiliated. I think I took this from 1903 or maybe 1904. And it's just to give this idea of, of just how kind of small and specialist a lot of the unions were at this time. Now, of course, this is just the GFTU affiliate list um, because once they, were, once they were created by the TUC, the TUC didn't really have anything to do with them. The, T, the GFTU just had to sort of, you know, recruit their, their affiliates as much as possible. And they never really, they never really kind of um, got to the, the point where they really, you know, the people that were found that founded the GFG wanted them to be as big as the TUC. They, they expected that anyone that would affiliate to the TUC would also affiliate to the GFU. It never quite happened that way. Um, the, the highest amount of affiliates that they got or membership that they got was 1.5 million workers by about 1921. Um, and for context, so the TUC at that point had 6 million. So they never quite reached that kind of level, unfortunately. But I think what's interesting here is you can see just so many different trades. You know, there were so many different types of work and a lot of the unions were really small. I think the, the smallest one that I've managed to find was a union of 22 workers. Now, of course, that is very, very small. That's not as, it's not all that indicative, but I think it gives a kind of real flavor of the different types of, of workers that the, the, that the GFTU could represent that, they were completely drowned out by the TUC. And in fact, e even still, that's something that a lot of the GFTU affiliates say now, that they feel more at home at the GFTU because they feel like it's a smaller umbrella organization. It's something that they feel they can, they can kind of actually have a voice. So it's, it's quite different, I think, as a different kind of experience. So the other thing that I think is a bit of a, an unsung hero part of the GFTU, now, when they, were, when they were created, it was supposed to be to administrate this strike fund, but the people that kind of ran the GFTU really took this idea and ran with it a little bit more. And they adapted the constitution to include work on conciliation. So they would kind of dispatch people to go and help like mediate disputes and try and stop disputes or try and, and get some kind of conciliation going as well. So they used to kind of help their, their affiliates 
actually navigate dis disputes as well, try and get them to, to stop and in a way that was good for the affiliates as well, although they were often accused of perhaps being more on the side of the employer on occasions. So unfortunately, there were some there was <laughs> there was some disputes that didn't quite go according to plan. Um, but the biggest thing, and I think that it's something that we we need a lot of in the movement that it's very difficult to actually track when this happens. But they encouraged a lot of am amalgamations. So these teeny tiny unions, these 22 workers here and these 100 workers over there, they were saying, you know, you you have you are working in very very close trains. You should be in a union together. And they would try and get them together. And, and they did that countless times. It's really difficult to track exactly who joined who. And trade unions have a terrible, terrible habit of changing their names. And it's difficult for historians of trade unions to track them sometimes. But I think that's one of the, the really good things about the early work of the GFTU because they consolidated a lot of the, the power of a lot of individual unions. So just go through. I just wanted to, to highlight this guy. So this man features in my thesis quite heavily. Um, he wasn't the first general secretary of the GFTU, that was Isaac Mitchell. He was the second, but he was definitely the most highly influential. So he, he was the person that really spurred on this, um, this kind of emphasis on, on creating amalgamations and creating a solid movement. Um, he was born in Nottingham and he was a lace maker by trade. His whole family were lace makers where he started work at the age of eight as an errand boy actually in the, in the trade. And then he worked his way up to be general secretary by the time he was 36. Um, and then he became general secretary of the GFGU in 1907. Um, but he was, he, was a very, <laughs> he was a very contentious individual. He was a really good, effective trade unionist. He, he absolutely loved bureaucracy. He was very good at sort of keeping track of everything. He was an excellent administrator. Um, unfortunately, he was also incredibly belligerent and difficult to work with. So when he took over the GFTU, um, I think that the kind of the tone of the GFTU gradually changed. And it's something that you can see in all of the records, in all of the management committee meetings. Um, increasingly, you get these kind of comments from other people on the committee saying, and it was decided that the general secretary just do as, the, as he thinks best, or it was decided that we would go with, with the general secretary's view or something like that. And he really became quite a kind of authoritative figure in the GFTU. Um, so when he took over in 1907, the GFTU were part of the joint board and actually they, they um, helped instigate the joint board. And that was an organization that um, just brought together the Labour Party, the TUC Parliamentary Committee and the GFDU. And the three of them together would try to work on you know, national issues and, and try and create a united voice for the whole labour movement. And within a couple of years of um, William Appleton's tenure, unfortunately the GFTU were ousted from the, from the joint board. And that is, that is in part his, his influence, it is. But it's also the, the changing nature of the labour movement at that time as well. I think there was a lot of changes around the GFTU. Now, when, when they were first created in 1899, we didn't have a Labour Party. So the TUC was, was also sort of trying to make sure we had industrial voices, political voices, and then it be, kind of became a little bit more important for us to work together, but also keep things separate. So there was, it would change year by year and the GFTU got really kind of caught up in that. But really in terms of his personality, um, it could be quite difficult <laughs> to say the least. Um, and I'm gonna try and illustrate that by telling you one of the little mini scandals of the GFTU. Um, it wasn't by, by any means the, uh, the biggest ruckus, but I think it's probably one, one of the most interesting stories. Um, so at the end of the 1909 conference, there was one last item of the agenda and it was uh, the issue of creating, sorry, increasing Appleton's salary. Um, he wasn't actually particularly well paid, I have to say, but in terms of uh, general secretary salaries, salaries at the time, so I think he probably did think he deserved it a little bit more money. Now, the GFTU records are absolutely fantastic for historians because they are verbatim and um, you can see exactly who said what. Like it's, it's, it's fantastic for someone that's trying to track who said what and you know, all these kind of things. Now, at the end of this 1909 report, suddenly the verbatim records kind of stop. And there is one comment that says, questions were asked whether uh, Mr. Appleton held a trade union card. 
So all of a sudden it doesn't say who said that and who's asking those questions. And the, the minutes kind of abruptly come to an end. Um, so what that's actually asking is that they're saying that William Appleton may not be a trade union member. So I, was, I looked at this and, I said, and it stopped me in my tracks. I thought, hang on a second, what's, what's happened here? When the records stop, historians have got <laughs> hardly anything to go on. Um, so I kind of carried on the thread of, of uh, communications and I could see from the management committee there were some investigations going and, and it got to the, to the next um, the conference that they held in Swansea in 1910 and the issue was picked back up again. So to cut a very long story short, <laughs> when um, Appleton left the Nottingham lace makers, there were two issues that, that arose. One, uh, when Chris Wardle took over as general secretary, it was discovered that Appleton had been taking under the table bribes from people that he was negotiating pay deals with for the lace makers. Uh, the lace makers took him to court over this and they actually won. He paid them some compensation for it a few years later. But the other issue was also that Appleton had set up the International Federation of Lace Making Unions. And that was a, a federation of the Nottingham, French and Scottish branches of, of, well, of, of lace makers. And when he left the lace makers, he didn't leave his position with, with the, the International Federation of Lace Makers. But the Nottingham lace makers felt that he should because he wasn't really a lace maker anymore. Um, and then again, they took him to court over that as well because he was receiving money from, from the, that federation, um, but they lost a technicality. So the, re the way that this comes out in the, in the minutes of the next meeting in 1910, after the GFG has had 12 months to investigate this, this accusation against Appleton, it's very interesting how the minutes present this because the minutes present a very clear, coherent discussion from the GFTU's management committee saying that we have received, we've asked for evidence and proof of wrongdoing and we've received nothing of the sort. We fully believe Appleton's character. We think he should be completely vindicated. It's a very orderly, very typical trade union speech that, that really kind of covers all the bases. But then Chris Wardle, the, the person that's made these accusations against Appleton, comes back and says, actually, I sent you these details. Here are the details. He explained the court cases. He explained what had happened, explained how they lost one case, but were vindicated in another. And then the following paragraph in the minutes, the GFG management committee simply say, they don't feel that there is an issue here and that Appleton is now a fully paid up member of some kind of different society. Therefore, the rules say he can still be general secretary. And I think it's really interesting because it's a way of the GFTU kind of using their, what kind of publication they can in order to create their own kind of organizational parameters, organizational identity, and to fully back somebody that they knew would, was good for them as a leader and as someone that was really keeping the GFTU together. And they decided that that was, I think that it was a, it was a trade-off. And I think that in the end, Appleton, without Appleton, I think the GFTU would have really suffered and perhaps they would have folded because there was a lot of things that happened in the 1920s in particular. They lost a lot of membership, um, you know, figures through, through a lot of different kinds of arguments, very similar arguments, unfortunately. But the GFTU really just carried on because Appleton made sure it carried on because he, because of his excellent administration capabilities and the way that he really fully believed in the GFTU. So as a historian, sort of looking at this kind of the way that minutes are crafted in order to, to conceal some kind of truth, but also to put forward an organizational identity, I think that's really interesting. Um, so I just finish on this part. The one very last thing I wanted to sort of say about the GFTU, like I said, right at the beginning, um, they are a very different organization now. There's a whistle stop tour for the, the remaining decades. In 1926, when we had the, the general strike, um, that's when the GFTU lost a lot of its membership because they, Appleton didn't believe in the general strike. He didn't believe that in, in the way it was called, and he didn't believe that uh, it was the right thing to do. And he actually refused to pay, pay any of the um, affiliates any strike money, any strike benefits, except for, I think, four stove grate workers in Sheffield, because they were, they were put out of work because of the strike. They didn't actually sort of go on strike. And after that, um, a lot of people lost faith in, in the GFTU as a strike fund administrator. I think a lot of people would say, well, you know, if we're not going to get money out when we need it, we don't want to pay in now. 
So the, the membership fees kind of plummeted. But by that point, Appleton had really set the GFTU up as, as, a, as a kind of quite a solid um, investigative um, body. So he would do a lot of work to investigate complaints, sort of industry-wide complaints. So a really interesting one that he did in uh, the potteries in, in Stoke and all about the industrial diseases that they had there and, and what the trade union movement could do. And again, this is kind of real background stuff, but it's integral to the movement, completely integral, but something that isn't quite as kind of loud and, and obvious to people outside the movement, that's the work that they do. And the GFTU you know, really kind of carried on doing that all through the 20s and 30s. And then in the 1940s and 50s, when they, they started having their education programs, um, they were real trailblazers, especially in sending women to like week long summer schools. Um, and they would they would really support a lot of people from working class backgrounds to go and, and get um, qualifications that they wouldn't have otherwise had any access to. And then that's really kind of snowballed, I think, into what we see today, which is the, the GFTU education program is is second to none. It's, it's, a, it's an excellent um, provision of different courses for reps and things like that. They don't do the uh, the lovely summer schools at Ruskin College and so you can get a week to go and study philosophy and economics, unfortunately, because that sounds amazing. But you can definitely go and get your health and safety course and your reps courses and, and even your leadership courses in trade unions.